if players go back too soon, their risk of a musculoskeletal injury, ankles, knees, you know, calf muscles, shoulders now, um, is, is up to two and a half fold risk of, of injury, just from a concussion. Hey there, welcome to our podcast. Before we jump into today's episode, could you please do us a solid? If you're enjoying what you hear, give us a five-star rating and hit that subscribe button on your platform. It really helps us reach more parents, coaches, and youth in the youth athlete development scene. All right, let's get into this week's chat. Welcome back to the In Athlete Podcast. I have got Professor Alan Pierce again. Uh, yeah, for round, round two, it's it been almost, what, 12, 14 months? Be about that. Yeah. And literally, it just became a shit show. <laughs> <laughs> about a month after from our last conversation. Um, if you just want to tell the people just a little bit about yourself, um, then yeah. we'll get, get cracking into, get into it. it. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm a, I'm a professor of neuroscience. My exact area of focus is neurophysiology um, of concussion and also understanding the long-term consequences of repeated what we call repeated neurotrauma so it's not just about concussion but the uh, repetitive impacts over a, a lifetime of uh, sport or other activities and so uh, yeah I've been at this now for 15 years and still still going strong <laughs> yeah it's um it's been a very busy 12 14 months for you it, it honestly yeah. has it's uh yeah it's certainly ramped up in the last uh, you know year to two years um, and, uh, you know, it doesn't seem to be uh, dissipating at all. It seems to just be getting more and more momentum now, which is kind of good in a way. Yeah, and I, remember, I listened to our last episode, and something I want to get clear, it was the head knocks. Obviously, you don't yes. like the term head knocks in your little no. special T-shirt that um, we'll put on as the thumbnail for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Is it's a head injury, it's a brain injury. Yeah, that's right. So one of the things that I start to get very ranty about is the fact that we use the term, a colloquial term of head knock, and for me it 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 uh, downplays the seriousness of what a concussion is, and and we can talk about it a bit more. But concussion, in short, is a brain injury, and when you talk about a head knock, you know people think, oh, well, I just bumped my head, knocked my head, and and we do that, you know, you just go down the stairs or, or knock a, you know. A, near the door oh yeah that's a bit of a, you know that that's what i call a head knock but when you're on the field and you know a, a 110 kilo player runs through you um that's not a head knock you know that and you you don't even know where you are that's that's a concussion and that's mm. one we've got to get people to understand that when these players are being concussed it's not just a a little knock to the head this is a, a serious injury that we need to address properly yeah and then talk about it's kind of it's kind of odd that we talk about concussions. Everyone sees like the the worst case scenario. Obviously, the NRL has been the last couple of weeks has been absolutely horrendous. You know, you mm. had three or four like major concu mm. concussions, the HIAs um, and whatnot. Mm. Then talk about the I guess the other side of I guess when it comes to head injuries and brain injuries that people don't really know about with more that repetitive nature. Mm. Yep. which is probably going to more affect younger kids than anything else. Yeah, so what we see, obviously, you know, as you said, with the, on TV is, is really the, the big hit and, and the concussion injury is something that everyone's focused on, but what we tend to gloss over or, or you know, miss, I suppose, and it's not, not by anyone's fault other than the fact that we're so focused on concussion is what we call these sub-concussive impacts. So these are the collisions, these are the bumps, these are the tackles going to ground. Um, the repetitive nature of these is what accumulates over time. And so what we are seeing with some of the cases that that uh, at the brain bank that we've diagnosed over the years, people like Danny Frawley, Shane Tuck, Heather Anderson, Paul Green um, in the NRL, is really been about tens of thousands of hits. Um, you know, NFL players uh, have been uh, calculated to have about 50,000 impacts over their career. Mm. You know, Australian footballers are probably in the vicinity of 20 to 30,000 hits over their career. Um, and that's what we're concerned about in terms of exposure for this disease, what we call chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. And so the science in the last, well, literally in the last year has progressed now to understand that this is a disease of exposure, not a disease of concussion. And um, if you start playing these sports earlier, your risk is 
increased because you're 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 exposed to impacts, repetitive impacts for a longer period of time. Yeah, it's it's like the old saying, death by a thousand cuts. Pretty much. Pretty much, exactly. I mean, the, the analogy is that, you know, oops, in the 1980s and, you know, we're not showing my age, but when I was growing up, you know, it was quite normal to be out in the sun for hours and hours over summer, every day, you know, and, and then we started to see that the exposure of, of excessive amounts of, of sun and, you know, we do need to have sunlight, I, I get that, for vitamin D and, and uh, sleep-wake cycles and things like that, but when we're standing out there or in the sun, in the beach for five, six hours a day, every day, um, down the beach, no sunscreen, then we started to see that there was this ex risk of, of melanoma. Um, you know, occasionally people might get burnt. It's not good, but you know, when you're, when you're out there for days and days, you know, weeks and weeks, months and months, years and years, then that's the, that's the risk for, you know, melanoma. Um, and now we have campaigns that say you've got to slip, slop, slap, you've got to be protected, don't stay out in the sun too long. Um, and that's kind of where we're trying to get at with um, repetitive impacts with, with um, sport. Yeah, then I guess what's changed within sport? Has the, has the protocols changed when it comes to concussion, HIAs? Um, like what's been the lay of the land over the last 12 months? Yeah, so there has been quite a bit of change um, in terms of concussion injury. So there's been a lot of, you know, uh, recommendations, obviously, for rule changes and things like that. But uh, what we've seen now is, is changes towards the management. So in the last sort of month and a half, the Australian Institute of Sport have finally come out and recommended 21 days um, from concussion to return to sport which is really a, a quite a significant leap from... Is that return to competition? Yeah, that is? Okay. yeah. so that's, that's full return to competition. So in, within that time, you know, the recommendations is to do what I call an active re rehabilitation, active recovery. Um, <clears throat> but um, the time that it takes to get back to full sport now is, is uh, you know, much longer than the, the previous 7 to 10 days, then the AFL have 12... NRL have 11, but at community level, junior level, it's 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 at um, 21 days, which is which is good to see. Yeah, I think that's probably the I can probably the best thing we've seen. It's because we spoke about it last time. It's yeah. like you know, it's almost like double the time that it takes for the brain to recover yeah. from an impact that's relative to from a kid that's you know adult size. Yeah, that's right, and and. It's not taking into account that symptom resolution means that brain, the brain has recovered. Hmm. So what we'll find is that you know players, kids, you know adults will will probably say that their their symptoms have recovered by you know three or four days, if not earlier. But that doesn't mean that the brain hasn't recovered. And hmm. you know we, we what we want people to do is is to get a full recovery, um, so that one there's no further risk or, or re significant reductions in risk of injury. So we know that if, if players go back too soon, their risk of a musculoskeletal injury, ankles, knees, you know, calf muscles, shoulders now, um, is, is up to two and a half fold risk of, of injury, just from a concussion. And the reason for that is that we understand that the processing of the brain is not optimal. So that's the difference mm. between you going into a contest and you know, sort of either evading a opponent or going into a contest and coming out of that contest okay, or getting injured, or not being able to evade an opponent because at least the connection between the brain and the muscles is is optimal rather than suboptimal. Yeah, like delayed or yeah. some sort of dysfunction. Inhibited. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I think well, that's definitely good for all parents to actually understand that side as well. Well, this is it. Yes, that's right. So it's it's. One, it's about brain health, but two, it's about having, I guess, you know, reduction of further injury. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's kind of funny because when I talk about concussion and, and uh, you know, the long-term effects and, and impairments to the brain, yeah, 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 okay, we get that. But you say, well, you know, you've got a risk of, of an ankle injury or whatever for two and a half times after a concussion, they kind of look at you and go, what? Does that mean I might roll my ankle and means I can't play? Uh -huh. So yeah. you get more, you actually get more engagement from that than the than the issue around brain health. Well, you add in the wet Melbourne's weather yes. <laughs> on top of that as well. It's windy, wet. Yeah, 
maybe the, the oval surface is uneven as yes. well. So you yep. basically, you got other factors can uh, influence that as well. That's right, absolutely. And if your brain's not, not you know, working optimally and, and obviously sending impulses to muscles. Proprioception. Yep, absolutely. That's all part of it. So, yeah, you add that in with the environmental conditions and, and it's likely that your risk is higher. Oh, gosh. <laughs> You're not painting a good picture for sport at the yeah, moment. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I get told I'm the prophet of doom, so. Well, I think, yeah, I think you're more, what's the saying, truth hurts? Yeah, that, that's it too, yes. It's an uncomfortable truth, yeah. The inconvenient truth. Inconvenient that's, truth, that's the one, yes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk about um, females and concussion mm-hmm. because I found an article, um, I was from the NIH, which is um, the US government's yeah. um, health body. Yeah. Um, and I'll just read this quote. So sex differences in concussion evidence supporting sex-based differences in risk and outcomes of concussion is growing. Can you just shed a bit, bit of light on that in terms of like what's the difference? Like what's happening? Well, that's a good question because we don't really know. <laughs> what we are seeing from the uh, data is that um, female athletes, girls and women, um, uh appearing to have a greater risk of in concussion injury uh, symptoms are, are reported as worse and symptom recovery appears to be reported longer than men as well so delayed delayed yeah and we're not really sure why that is the case at the moment that's really a focus of of the research you know there are there are uh, researchers looking at potential hormonal differences that may be exacerbating that, but we don't have very much data on that at the moment, so that's that's one area that we're trying to look at. Um, but one of the areas that I'm... A, I guess I'm a little bit sceptical at the moment because a lot of the research that's being reported to date has stemmed from self-reports. So if you're concussed, you need mm. to do the... Uh, you know, the sport concussion assessment tool, um, you know, you're reporting your symptoms, the severity of those symptoms, and, um, you know, as, as over time you, you continually report it. So it's all verbalised. And we know, and I, don't, I think we've touched on this before, but men are, are really bad at being honest on their <laughs> hint symptoms. You know, oh, I'm all okay. I'm all right. Yeah, no, it's 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 just a mild headache. It's not, you know, um, I, I yeah, I'm okay. And then several days later, oh, I'm good to go back to training. I'm I'm okay. I have no symptoms. You can see me. I'm I'm fine. You know. Whereas, we've done research. You know, we've done two papers now where we saw disparities between men and women in terms of their attitudes and behaviours to reporting of concussion. Mm. And women were report. You know, in their in our questionnaire were saying, well, yes, I'm more likely to say, you know, we found that they were more likely to say, yes, I, I won't play if I'm concussed, whereas the men were saying, oh, I'll hide it, I will. Is that because, like, female nature is more, like, risk-adverse? Possibly. We, we didn't sort of go into that part, but we, yeah. we certainly saw a difference. And we also saw women were saying, you know, answering that they were more likely to complete rehab, whereas men were less likely to complete full rehab. <laughs> you know, if they're feeling all right, they're going to go back. Yeah. Now, there could be more of a, a cultural issue at the moment around, um, you know, this whole, uh, you know, masculine identities around the fact that you don't want to be seen as weak. Mm. Um, you don't want to be letting down your teammates. It's a badge of honour. That's getting less and less. Um, so when we did a follow-up study, the, the, the difference was, was um, closer There was still a difference, but it wasn't as pronounced as what it was six or seven years ago, um, which is good. But a colleague of mine who I we are doing some um, research together and trying to compare from a physiological perspective men and women after a concussion. You know, she she made the really good um, observation that with the professionalisation of women's sport now, we might start to see more women at the top level trying to get back sooner so it'll be a, it's a watch this space uh, okay yeah yeah the pressures of earning the the salary getting mm. bonuses because it might be contingent on them yep, playing each is. game that's yeah. right so you know just like the afl men's i suppose you're on a base salary and then you get paid extra for for each of the games it's certainly the same with the women and particularly because the women are not being paid as well as the men Hmm. If they get concussed and they're out for, you know, 
two matches, maybe three matches of an eight match, you know, um, season, well, that, that's quite significant. Wow. So, yes. Well, so it's going to be a real watch this space. I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it might be starting to happen now already. And that's mm. something that we're, we're trying to, we want to educate everyone. You know, it's, 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 um, it's not just a, a male versus female thing here. Yeah, I think it. Um, I think it, as you mentioned before, it's come from like a shift from like when it all costs to like yeah. what's this win going to cost me now. Well, this is what um, you know we're seeing with Nathan Murphy. You know, this week um, Angus Brayshaw a couple of weeks ago, slight different case, but we'll, you know, it's it's still players now realizing that you know they've got the rest of their lives to live here, and um, you know, is it really worth it? Mm. Um, I think today uh, I've just published an article in The Conversation about that. So I'll, I'll give you a link to that. So, you know, are we starting to see players now balance up, you know, the, the, the win-at-all-costs attitude versus, well, I've got potentially 50 years of, of extra living to do here mm -hmm. and I want to make sure that I know what my kids' names are and who I am at, at uh, you know, 80 years of age rather than at losing it all at 50. Mm. Um, yeah, because I've... From what I'm seeing at the moment is, I think the NRL, I think the average career in the NRL is about three years, mm. roughly, right? And then I think what potentially might change that as well, that mentality is making sure that the clubs themselves have pathways out of the yeah. sport. Yeah. And I think that will start to change the shift because I remember there was, um, there was a NFL player for San Francisco. So when um, concussion, the whole the thing with Ben and Omalu and all oh, those yes. reports came out, yeah. and then they thought this was going to be like the the downfall of the NFL. And obviously, mm. it, it kind of like no, it's no. the most popular brand, <laughs> yeah, most popular sport in the world at the moment. That's it. They get like a billion viewers for yeah. um, the Super Bowl. Yeah. They um, yeah, there's there a couple of players who be like, no, nah, this is no longer worth the risk. I think, yep. and they realised that, you know, they collected their paycheck and they were like ready to transition now. Mm. And I think what a lot of clubs in Australia are going to have to start doing now is realise that it's not the AFL or professional sport is, is the destination. Yep. I think a lot of athletes are starting to figure out figure that out now mm. when it's probably a little bit too late <laughs> yeah. or you know what's better late than never to actually try and find a path out whether yeah. it's you know starting your own business or get yeah. a partnership with someone or something yeah. like that and actually yeah. transition out of the sport um that's right. in a way that's on your own terms not yeah. not in this case with um oh, well, um what was his name again um uh, that was, it was in the paper this week oh nathan nathan yeah you know he, he had to retire yes because someone, right. someone basically the afl told him to yeah, and that's it's an interesting case for Nathan Murphy because we forget that back in October <coughs> last year, I mean after the grand final where he subbed himself out, but after the you know sort of the the dust settled on that, you know he was actually cleared by the same medical panel to return to training. Oh, so let's go into that then. <laughs> uh, is it is it getting to the point where it's it, it's a self regulated industry now? Well, this it's it's. They've always been a self-regulating industry, but it's True. getting more... I think people are getting more aware that they are a self-regulating industry. Mm. Um, I think that's that's been the issue. So um, one of the, I guess, the comments that has come out, not just from here in Australia with the, the federal parliamentary inquiry into concussion in sport, um, but also the UK uh, uh, parliamentary inquiry into concussion in sport was the fact that these these sports are marking their own homework. They are certainly accountable to nobody but themselves because they're, they're so well financially resourced. They're not like minor sports who depend upon the Sports Commission for funding to keep them going. Um, you know, so there's, there's no one there to tell them otherwise. Um, so it, it does make it very difficult to try and hold the behaviour to account. Yeah, I think um, I think the yeah that's probably the biggest issue is, but how do we go about <clears throat> fixing that? Well, it's it's through education, it's it's talking to you guys, going out to clubs, giving seminars, um, you know, obviously doing mainstream media as well to keep talking about it because for many many years it's been a culture of silence. You know, oh, we don't want to talk about that. That that makes the sport look bad, or I don't want to be seen as ungrateful. Um, I don't want to 
feel that you know I'm I'm being negative about something that's that has so many positives. So you know, sport has so many fantastic positives. You know, team sports have have all sorts of of physical and mental health benefits um, as much as individual sports. Um, you know, we want people to be play, doing physically active playing sports, but we just want them to be safe. That's that's what it's coming down to. It's it's about having safety and being able to play these sports um, as 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 you know to win and and to 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 do your best, but in a safe environment. You know, we should have we shouldn't have anyone not coming home because of a sporting event. Mm. So you know, this is this is what we're concerned about. Is that you know there are potential life threatening issues here that we've we've got to at least get people to understand. Yeah, um, slightly off topic, but. Do you follow the UFC at all? No, I don't. I, I find it really hard to watch. <laughs> it's a, it's, it's, it's a, a modern-day gladiators, essentially. Yeah. So, um, recently, it was UFC 300. Max Holloway, um, he won the, the BF, BMF title. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not too sure exactly what it means, but I've got a bit of an idea. I won't say it because yes. I'll, I'll keep the PG on here. Yes. Um, anyways, he's been on podcasts before and talking about sparring. In, com- yeah. in combat sports and, yeah. yeah and what he's been saying is he's actually stopped sparring what um, pretty much full stop and a lot of a lot of legends in whether in the fight game or in boxing yeah. or in combat sports have yeah. really backed off heavily in that space but for some reason even at like the junior levels or you know it's kind of se- seen as like you're weak or yes. like, as you mentioned before it's like um Weak, or I'll keep the other words out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Soft. Yes. That you're you're not getting in there and you know throwing hands, throwing hard bombs yes. at each other. Yeah. And I found it really interesting because with boxing, it's like you have such a long time frame in between each fight mm. or in, in between mm-hmm. each um, mm-hmm. match. Yeah. And then obviously you allow the brain to recover mm. in between that. And obviously um, mm. Dan Gardner, who's I guess a big. Um, he's big in the nutrition. He's big in the US. Um, he looks after a lot of UFC guys. Mm. He helps them with like supplementation protocols mm-hmm. as well to actually get their brain back to normal mm. function. I want to go back to like reducing the actual amount of contact, especially mm. for combat sports. Mm. And then the, the story you're talking about, the Harlequins. Mm. I still remember that. I still mm. tell that story to this day. Yeah. How how is like just talk to the people. Just kind of what does that actually mean by just backing off the, the head? impacts and then what it can actually do in terms of improving performance yeah so you know one of the things that has you know we're starting to understand from the science is that we need to train athletes smarter not harder the the old school of of training the way that you trained isn't necessarily the best and 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 what i mean by that is you know coaches saying well back in the day i did this this, and this and we know now from you know that's not the best way to prepare athletes optimally and the issue you know with uh, the harlequins for example was that they had instrumented mouth guards in their um, kit and they were able to look at the number of impacts that were going to the brain and you know at that time they were at the bottom of the the table um, in their league and you know they, they, they backed off and one of the consequences of, of backing off hard physical training week after week was that they weren't going into matches fatigued so one of the, the old traditional ways of training was that you just train so hard and then going into matches you, you, you know you just had almost nothing to give because you trained so hard during the week rather than tapering off hmm. And so what they did was they tapered off and realised that the players were not as fatigued and were going into matches fresh and playing against fatigued play op- opponents. They ended up winning the premiership and everyone, well, what did you do? And they said, well, we, we backed off a lot of the, the hard training, which incidentally caused a lot of impacts to the brain, mm. and we focused in on skills and, and strategies and, and getting our, our plays right. Um, and so as a consequence of that, UK rugby, the RFU, went, oh, hang on a moment, we're going to mandate this for everyone now. So in, a, in the UK, they have mandated 15 minutes of physical training per week maximum. So the rest of the time, they need to be focusing in on other aspects of the game rather than just smashing each other. Mm. 
And so we're starting to see that permeate through to the combat sports. And it's great that, uh, you know, some of the professional athletes are now realising that they don't have to keep smashing their heads, you know, the whole time. They can work on other ma- other aspects of their game, of their, of their sport, of their techniques. Um, the coroner for the Shane Tuck inquiry in December said that he wants to recommend limited physical training or, you know, as in contact um, during pre-season because that's where most of the the concussions occur is in pre-season for AFL. Wow. Because they're training so hard, particularly the, 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 the teams that are at the bottom of the table trying to lift their standards. And also like bottomless guys as well. Yes. Potentially the same time. That's right. Themselves. Exactly. So um, it was quite interesting when that, that uh, bit of news came out. Over the next sort of month or two, there was just this in, almost increase in, in media awareness of another player's been concussed in training. Another player's been concussed in training. And all of a sudden it was like, because one of the, the, you know, the comments that were coming from some of the old guard in the AFL were, oh, we don't see many concussions in training. It's never, ha-, you know, we don't do that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden, bing, 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 bing. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't make them look very good. But what we're seeing is it's not a drop-in standard of, of, um, of play or, or com- competition. If anything, we're probably going to see a, an increase, an improvement, because players are not going to be going in, going, oh, jeez, I've got to get myself up for this match today. I, I really have, I'm not. So we've got to think about training smarter mm. and, and not just, you know, harder. Yeah, and then I also remembered um, you spoke about, I think it was in the UK, about headering. As yes. well, that you yes. can't. There's no headering before or after matches, like in 24 Scotland. hours. It's right. Scotland, sorry. Yeah, in Scotland. So that, that's still going at the moment in terms of a trial, and heading for 12 years and under is still going on as a trial in the UK. Okay. Yeah, for soccer. Yeah. yeah. So it'll be interesting to see what the what the outcome is there. Yeah. Yeah, it's a. I, I think it'll be good because. Especially with Aussie kids here, I know a lot of them wanted to get into these academy programs as yes. well overseas. Yeah, I think if we can start, and I know coaching wise, a lot of the international coaches will actually come over here mm. and actually work in a lot of the I guess MPL programs that mm-hmm. we have in Australia, mm. and then they're going to try and bring up the next generation as well. Yes. So hopefully that has a bit of a flow on effect in terms of how yeah. they actually start to operate. Um, Absolutely, um, here at a junior level. Absolutely. Um, and, and a point too that you made before, which I think is really, I think are really important to let people know, because everyone's so worried that you know, it's almost an existential crisis for these sports, and and as you said, NFL is more popular than ever. We've known since 1928 in combat sports that repetitive impacts damage the brain. Mm. It has not affected these sports one bit in terms of of people participating, spectators, money, the money involved is bigger than ever um, and I think one of the things that's come from that is that there has been and it was kind of brought on by the Muhammad Ali issue that they went okay yeah we acknowledge that there's some issues now but it's that acknowledgement that okay um, if you participate in these sports there is this risk if you are knocked out in about you cannot participate for 30 60 90 days the combat sports have kind of got that right. They can still improve, but they've got that, I guess, transparency about it. In boxing and UFC, you know, some, you know, it's a high likelihood it's going to happen. The, like you literally bet game. on it. Yeah. yeah, it's the name of the game, which yeah. is why the Australian, you know, the medical associations around the world want want it banned, because it's you know it's 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 a sport that you, the objective is to. Give Knocks an opponent out. a brain injury. <laughs> yeah, literally. <laughs> yes. I know. Um, yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of flabbergasting. But I think as we get more awareness, yeah. especially from a lot of these high-profile athletes, and I th- yes. you also said in terms of like the terminology and the information getting out there, yeah. there's one thing to be the researcher, and then unfortunately it's like, oh, what do you know? You never played sport. And, you yeah. Know, you might get that argument from time yeah, to time, yeah. or you know, it's going to be damaging to the sport. But yeah. then. Like we said, with UFC and all these, you know, fighters coming out, they're being called soft and weak. Mm. But 
the champions. Mm. It's like how like it, yes. the the old argument of harder is better. Yeah, is not necessarily the case anymore. No, exactly. And you know, it's I suppose as a you know as a, a SSC coach yourself, you know, you're you're not just training everyone to fatigue. No, <laughs> driving adaptation. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. And so, you know, thirty years ago, people would have gone, "What are you doing?" If they don't train to fatigue, you're not going to get the adaptation. But we know now that that's not the, the case. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, there's, there's a lot of things that have, that have changed mm. within the s world, mm. uh, for sure. You have just listened to the Inner Athlete Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date with the release of weekly episodes. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram to get great tips on all things youth athlete development and youth mentoring.